All right, so today we're dealing with Jesse Duplantis. Hands down, one of the most blasphemous men on the face of the earth today. He's going to be telling you about his trip to heaven, in which he arrived via cable car of sorts, and telling you everything that he saw. Apparently that's permitted now. It wasn't permitted when Paul went, but I guess it's permitted now. So I'll be playing you some clips, and we'll be commenting as we go. Here we go. All right, so Jesse's here in front of a church, and he's telling his testimony. At this moment, you're supposed to believe that he's in heaven and he's talking with Paul the Apostle. And so let's pick it up from there. That's God. He's a creator. So I said, listen, I want to come back and talk. He said, okay, thank you. He said, Jesse, thanks for coming to my home. I said, you got a nice house. He said, wait till you see yours. I said, you been to my house? Yeah, he said, Jesus personally built it for you. So after the Apostle Paul thanks Jesse for coming to his house, Paul reveals to Jesse that unlike, apparently unlike everyone else's house or their mansion up in heaven, that Jesus personally built Jesse's home. I guess because Jesse is so awesome. But of course, right? Jesus Christ, the architect, creator of all things, who shed his blood for us in an agonizing death, whom Ephesians chapter 1 describes as far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, personally built Jesse his home. It's absolutely astounding what this man thinks of himself, having no fear of God. The narcissism is immeasurable. Now, you may disagree with me, but even Paul says, if you believe this, he alluded to the fact, well, Jesus didn't personally build my house, but you're going to like yours because he personally built yours, Jesse. We don't know. We didn't get any word on, you know, David, Moses, John the Baptist, Daniel, Peter, Elijah. But we do know that Jesus Christ personally built Jesse Duplantis' home up in heaven. This guy is super special. Now, in this next clip, Jesse is talking to Jesus Christ. And listen to what he says here. Physically here. And yet he could hear my thoughts. And he would answer me in my thoughts. And I said, Lord, you got the wrong man here. I said, I'm just a, I'm just a, I'm just a evangelist preaching Sunday through Wednesday meetings. This is 1988, you know. I said, you need Billy Graham. Go tell my people, well, you need somebody like that. And he just smiled. He said, no, you will do it. What I did not know without sounding prior for Erica today on ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, PBS. I'm on all those channels. I'm preaching to 2.9 billion people in 14 different languages. So here is Jesse, just with a massive brag, very braggatory. Says that he's preaching to 2.9 billion people. Now I checked some of the numbers, demographics. Right now there's roughly 8 billion people on the face of the earth. But about 25% of the world population is under the age of 14. 25%. And if I you know, eliminated that demographic, because I, I just don't think 14 and under are going to listen to Jesse Duplantis, that'll leave us with about 6 billion people. So according to Jesse Duplantis, he's preaching to half the world population. That'd be almost half. He said 2.9. 2.9 billion. Do you believe that he's preaching to all those people? Well, of course not. This man wants you to think that he's that important, that he possibly could be the single greatest voice for Christ on the face of the earth, which is laughably absurd. 
Now, in this next clip, uh, Jesse is walking and touring heaven. He's going to talk about the animals. So here we go. And I, I just looked at one horse, and he, and he just looked at him, and I could hear him thinking. And he said this, thanks for coming. So, so here Jesse says that he looked at a horse, and he could hear the horse thinking. And then the horse just casually said, hey, Jess, thanks for coming. Just thought I'd throw this one in there because right now in the audience, you have a pretty good mixture of people, executives, doctors, lawyers, college graduates, and they're all sitting out there laughing and, and believing this man, talking horses, Mr. Ed, up in heaven, looking at Jesse and saying, thanks for coming, Jesse. Rear! We're just so happy you're here. Hey, you wouldn't happen to have a, a carrot on you, would you? Well, I thought I'd ask. It's just so absurd, but people love fantasy, don't they? Now, again, are there talking horses in heaven? I don't know. But here's what I do know. Jesse Duplantis is a liar. He did not go to heaven. So I'll, we'll move on to the next clip here. And at the throne, I saw something. Never forget as long as I live. In the smoke, I saw babies coming out. They had the ability to fly. And they had, Charlie, they had little nightgowns on. That's the only way I can say that. And I said, What is that? He said, That's the thoughts of God. So here, Jesse, as you heard, he's right in the throne room, right there in the throne room, telling a story about flying babies coming out of the smoke, wearing nightgowns. Apparently these uh, babies are the thoughts of God. Is it true? Well, no. We know Jesse didn't go to heaven. But what you're listening to is storytelling. Well, because everybody loves babies. And apparently these babies, you don't have to worry about <laughs> pooping or slobbering, stuffy noses or anything like that. Um... They've mastered aerodynamics. They can fly. And uh, enough to, you know, I, I don't know, are they spirits? Well, I don't know. They, he said they were wearing nightgowns. So again, more storytelling. All right, so in this next clip, now uh, apparently King David has taken over the tour. And King David has brought Jesse Duplantis to his house. You know, the house that Jesus Christ personally built for him. And uh, so we'll pick it up from there. Listen to this blasphemy. It's unbelievable. Also listen to him take the Lord's name in vain. And David opened up the door of my house. He said, Jesus made a table for you. I said, he did. And I love foyers. To me, foyers dictate what a house should look like. And this house of mine is God. I, they say I live in a mansion. It's an old house. <laughs> Nothing compared to what I got in heaven. And I got a beautiful home. Don't misunderstand. Oh, I walked in and I walked up and this table has two gold eagles sitting, looking at each other. And one wing is like this. He said, the Lord personally made that for you. I said, my God, I'm doing good. Huh? He said, yes, you are. Now, again, just simply stunning. Here he's got Jesus still serving him. And some of you might disagree, but Jesse is that awesome. Jesus personally built his mansion in heaven. And then uh, because I guess Jesus was a carpenter, he built him a table with two eagles. And it, it almost sounded like he wanted to describe the Ark of the Covenant with the cherubims on top, with the wings stretched forward. But maybe he caught himself and backed it up. But at the end here, my... I'm doing good, aren't I? And then King David says, yes, you are, Jesse. You're doing good. Now, just for the record, this is Jesse Duplantis' home on Earth. Not too bad, huh? Ask yourself, how did he pay for this? Well, he paid for this doing what he does best, tell stories. He sure didn't work for it. Now, a quick Google or Yahoo search will reveal Jesse's net worth. 
Here it says he's at 30 million. This one says he's at 20 million. It varies depending on where you look. This one's out of at uh, 40 million dollars. Of course, this doesn't include his private jet or many other assets that this man has. Just incredible. All right, so in this next clip, uh, Jesus is again talking with Jesse here. And I was sitting there, I mean, standing there, and we're just talking. I said, thanks for the table. He said, I, I did my best. I said, this is nice. He said, I thought so. I knew what you like, and I did your taste, but I added some of mine in there. I said, well, every time I look at it, I'm going to think of you. He said, thank you, Jesse. He so again, here we've got Jesus thanking Jesse. For what, you might ask? Well, for material things, the table. Because uh, we know that Jesse's taste is first and foremost on the mind of our Lord and Savior who shed his blood for us. It was all about the designing of the table, so on and so forth, and it was all to please Jesse, material things. Because whether you believe it or not, that's what Jesse's all about. I don't think I have to try very hard to convince you. But as he stands and just casually converses with Jesus Christ, it's just very flippant, isn't it? There's no reverence for God by this man. He's an absolute liar and blasphemer. All right, so now as uh, Jesse's ready to wrap up his tour of heaven, uh, well, we'll just, just listen. And I'm just thinking, he said, it's time for you to go to work. It's time for you to go home. He said, David, take Jesse back to the, take him by the way of the mountains. He likes mountains. So Jesus commands King David to take Jesse back, but take him a, a special way, you know, by the mountains, because Jesse likes the mountains. So here Jesus has King David serving Jesse. And because Jesse's so awesome, he wants Jesse to see the mountains in heaven because he wants to please Jesse. See, it's all about Jesse. And these people in the audience who I will certainly pray for, especially this guy with his, just this sweet mullet going on here, but they just think this is real. They absolutely throw out common sense and biblical doctrine while this guy sits up there and lies in the name of Jesus Christ. All right, in this next clip, he's still saying his goodbyes to Jesus, but listen to this. But I got to tell you something. I saw Jesus cry. When I would look into his face, it was so bright, but I saw tears. He said, hey, I'll never forget this as long as I ever live. He said, my worst day is yet to come. I thought the worst day was the crucifixion. It's the judgment. He said, Jesse, you know, when I said in my word, I will wipe away all tears. I said, yeah. He said, that includes me too. Now you can take this however you want. I have my own thoughts, but I wanted to show you that because this is going to come into play later on here in just a minute or two. All right, in this next clip, Jesse's back from heaven. He's gone on living his life. And then he is uh, comes across a child who's going to give him a word of knowledge or a prophecy. Until the Lord had a child, a young man, give me a word of knowledge. And he brought me back to heaven. He said, but Jesse, the Lord told me to tell you something. I said, tell me, young man. He's just a kid. He said, you know, the devil's afraid of you. You get in front of you, you run him over, kick him in the head. He just, you just beat him and walk on him. So now Jesse says he got a prophecy from a child that said the devil is afraid of him. Hmm. Well, it's not a surprise to hear Jesse self-testifying about himself. But tell me, 
What do you think the devil is most afraid of when it comes to Jesse Duplantis? Is it his Rolex? His many luxurious homes? His love of money? Which includes millions and millions of dollars? Maybe the devil is afraid of Jesse's private chat. What does the devil fear from Jesse Duplantis? Well, quite frankly, nothing. The truth of the matter is, the devil loves Jesse Duplantis. In fact, if the, if the devil had or has a checklist and a description in which he would design the most perfect, villainous, deceiving, blasphemous, power-hungry, shameless, lying, narcissistic, egotistical, seared conscience, evil minister of Satan who pretended to serve Jesus Christ while in fact preaching and teaching a plethora of false doctrines, Jesse Duplantis would not only check all the boxes on the devil's list, he would vastly exceed all the devil's expectations by far. This man is zero threat to the devil. He works for the devil. The devil does not fear him. So now Jesse is going to uh, tell you the next <laughs> part of his story. After he got home from heaven, uh, and then what ensued after that. So listen to this. This one, I think, is about a minute long. And I had been in heaven five hours and 15 minutes. And I looked at the clock and I went, oh, my God. Oh, man. They, it's 6.15. They're going to pick me up at quarter to seven. I got to preach tonight. Now, what I didn't notice, John, I was lit up like a light. But I couldn't see it, CJ. I'm shaving I'm taking a quick shower, shaving, brushing my teeth, doing everything. And this man that was picking me up, he would, he'd just talk all the time when he picked me up, which was fine, you know. And it, 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 it's, uh, you know, 6.45, pop, pop. I heard him like, I said, man. So I just finished. I said, I'll be there in just a minute, you know. And I, okay. When I opened up the door, he went, he just backed away and didn't say nothing. And I just looked at him. I said, okay, let me get my Bible, I'll be out. He didn't say one word to me going over to the Magnolia Christian Center. Now, before, he'd been talking like crazy. I was lit up like a light, but I couldn't see it. I brushed my teeth, I shaved, you know, I showered, I did everything, you know, nothing. So I never thought, I got there at 7 o'clock, service starts at 7. Now, I can prove this. When I got out the car, the man, he was just, I thought, what's Maybe I offended him. You know, John, I thought maybe I said something. You know, I don't know. So I walked into the church. You walk into the foyer of the church, and you turn this way to go into the sanctuary. Now, that church has aisles on the side like that. Uh, then, I don't know how it is now, and just big, huge, long pews. So I'm going to walk on the side of the building like this. And Randy, I'm lit. And everybody started. They stood up and looked at me. And then they looked at the lights. I was shining. I was lit up, but I couldn't see it. They thought it was the TV lights. There was no spotlights. I didn't know anything. I couldn't see nothing. You know, I'm talking about me. This is me. You know, just me. All right. So if you didn't understand what Jesse was saying here, Jesse says that he was glowing. So this is uh, ripped right from the headlines. The headlines being Moses. Just like Moses. Jesse was glowing. Is this true? Is there any video? Was there one picture taken? No, of course not. This is storytelling. You just have to believe him. But it's, again, so interesting. This is Jesse stealing. It is just a, a matter of speech. As a way of saying, stealing the glory of Moses which came from God. This is Jesse saying, I'm as important as Moses, because just like him, I was uh, in the presence of God. In fact, he went above what anything Moses ever did, at least as far as we know. Jesse went to heaven. M Moses was just at Mount Sinai. <laughs> so he was glowing just like Moses. And, and again, the people in the audience, really? Wow, we just... Flat out believe you, Jesse. No proof necessary. Even though we live in an age, even, even back in 1988, I don't think there was cameras back then. 
think there was video cameras as well, but nobody documented this apparently. You just have to believe, and they do. Now, Jesse is continuing on, so listen to this. Many encounters like that since those days. And I was probably asking in the flesh, because I was a baby Christian, but today I don't have to ask. He'll come see me somehow. Just talk to him. Wake me up in the middle of the night. Woke me up three weeks ago. I went, what? He said, I'm watching you sleep. I said, you're watching me sleep? He said, yeah. He said, you know where I learned that? I said, no. He said, you. Remember when we used to walk into Jody's bedroom? She was in that little bassinet thing. She was just a baby. You go look at her, listen to her breathe. Now, if you haven't thrown up by now, spewed all over yourself, uh, congratulations. But here... Jesse says that Jesus walked into his room and uh, Jesus was just apparently so enamored with Jesse that he was just watching him sleep because Jesse is that awesome. And, and even saying, eluding, you know, Jesus didn't even know how to do that. But Jesse, do you know how I learned how to watch you sleep? By watching you watch your child sleep. I learned it from you. So thank God that uh, Jesse taught Jesus something, apparently. This man, he, he's not simply narcissistic. He is the king of all narcissism. And, and again, the blasphemy of these lies and saying that there are the people out there again believing this. Wow. But this is all for purpose. This is building up. He's portraying himself basically as the greatest man that's ever been created by God. In fact, I believe if he was allowed to live long enough, his story might even evolve into making himself equal with God. I wouldn't put it past him. It's breathtaking. Watch. He said, you're still my child. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, nothing. I'd like to talk to you. Get up. Boom, I get up. So I go straight in that study. And, well, you know, we're laughing and talking and having a wonderful time. So he goes on to say that, hey, fellas, hey, gals, you too. If you're someday as awesome as I am, you too can have Jesus just wake you up in the middle of the night. Go on into the study. And, you know, have some coffee, have some donuts maybe, I don't know. And you can just laugh and sort of hang out and chillax with Jesus, sharing stories. But until then, you're not as awesome as me. This is what Jesse wants you to believe. It's absolutely fascinating to watch this liar operate. Now, in this clip, uh, Clearly, Jesse says he's going to live to be 120 years old. When he told her, that's not my time. When he turned the water to one, it's not my time. But he did it. I like to go to heaven with my family. But if not, I'll take the 120 years with full ability, capability, and capacity. But I prefer you come in my lifetime. So just having that casual convo with Jesus, he's like, well, I'd, I'd really like you to come in my lifetime. But if not... I'll take the 120 years, full capacity, good health, all his uh, motor functions uh, in perfect condition, I guess. This is what he's saying. Now, in this next clip, uh, one of the most blaspheming things he says uh, throughout this whole message. And about three weeks ago, I heard the father go, <laughs> I know that voice. He chuckled. And the reason why he hadn't told Jesus, because Jesus will tell us. He will. He will do it. I see. He'll say, Thursday, 2 o'clock. <laughs> he will do it, I'm telling you. Now, in that clip you just heard, Jesse says that God the Father uh, says that the reason he doesn't tell Jesus the time of the rapture is because Jesus apparently couldn't hold that secret. He would tell us. 
you know, Thursday at two o'clock, he would tell us. Now that clip there is, for me, it, it doesn't even register on the blasphemy scale. It would blow the scale up. It literally causes me to fear and tremble for Jesse Duplantis as to how long God Almighty would allow such antichrist and satanic rhetoric to continue before God puts an end to it. Isn't that a heck of a thing to say about Jesus Christ? To say such a thing that somehow Jesus wouldn't or couldn't be able to keep God the Father's timing of the rapture private he is saying that Jesus Christ would or could defy the Father intentionally. And furthermore, to paint or describe Jesus in this manner is so utterly blasphemous, I don't have the words. As though Jesus Christ is weak and or akin to spilling heavenly secrets because he just doesn't have the strength enough to be obedient to the Father, that he couldn't hold the rapture timing. This is just sin. Oh, this is such absolute sin. The lack of fear and the lack of reverence for Jesus Christ and all of heaven by Jesse Duplantis is breathtaking. And I shudder for this man. He has a history. And I think many others would agree. He has a history. I would say the greatest history of blasphemy against the living God. And he does it all for money. All right. So now he's going to close this up. Check this out. I'm Jesse Duplantis and I approve this testimony. Give the Lord a hand clap for that. Did you enjoy it? Did it witness to you? Now, look closely. You can see people giving him a standing ovation. You can get past this guy right here. Look at that. Do you think they enjoyed these lies, this delusion, this deceit? They most certainly did. And now we're going to see the payoff. I was going to dismiss you, and the Lord spoke to me about receiving an offer, and I said, I don't want to do that. He said, I'm not asking what you don't want to do. <laughs> I'm yours to command. I'm going to ask you to help me so Jesus don't have to cry no more. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to ask you to help me so Jesus won't have to cry no more. I've asked the Lord for every dollar given in my ministry. Give me a soul into the kingdom. I will not sleep nor rest until that comes to pass. All right. So what Jesse's done is he's brought this all to finality of what he's been lying about in this fantasy story for almost two hours. He states, well, I wasn't going to ask for an offering, but here's God. He says that I have to do this. I wasn't going to do it, but God insists on this. It's not me. And he says to the brain-melted people listening there at the church and the over 1.3 million people who have watched this on the Internet, I want you to help me so that Jesus don't have to cry no more. Jesus don't have to cry no more. He says that twice. He wants you to believe that Jesus is frail and weak and in a constant state of blubbering. He's crying and he needs my help. So Jesse's request to the people is, give me your money and I can help Jesus to stop crying. Yes, that's that's what Jesse's saying. It's, it's Jesse to the rescue. Jesse is going to have to go, well, save the Savior. And the way that he's going to do this is by you giving him money. Jesus is in trouble. Don't you want to help Jesus? Then empty your wallets and fork over those Benjamins. 
he even states that he vowed to God. I'm not sure if I played that clip, but he vowed to God that every dollar that comes in would be a soul saved for the kingdom of God and that he would not sleep or rest until that comes to pass. So apparently Jesse has not slept. He even cites an example of a lady who gave him a million dollars and thus confirming to this lady that, well, she indeed just helped save a million souls. Confirmed, I guess, that one lady alone. Wow. Lord, for every dollar given to my ministry, give me a soul into the kingdom. I will not sleep nor rest until that comes to pass. I told a lady the other day, she gave me a million dollars. I said, I got a million souls for you. I can prove it. Well, she busted out crying. So you heard that. The lady busted out crying, according to Jesse, because she thinks that by giving, you know, all that money that she's saving souls. Now, here's the thing I want to say. If you're donating money to legitimate ministries, uh, that's a wonderful thing. And I'm not discouraging anybody to donate money to help spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that's not this. Jesse is scamming people. So this is this is quite different. This guy's a flim flammer. He's a snake oil salesman. This money goes directly into his pocket. So this is quite a scam. What a con, right? Equating one dollar for a soul saved. Where's the math in that? Is that guaranteed? That that sounds that sounds very deceitful. But you've got the listeners thinking, and they're doing the math as to how much they can give Jesse. Well, for every dollar, I could give $100. That would be 100 souls or maybe 200. But I really want to be someone great like Jesse. I want to be great in the kingdom of heaven. I want, I want Jesus to personally build my mansion and maybe a piece of furniture. So I'm going to reach deep into my pockets and give even more. And they tally to themselves their own personal lists. It's just so atrocious, isn't it? But if you don't give enough, well, Jesus is going to keep crying and crying and crying. And that's not right because Jesse needs to get this money so that he can cause Jesus to cease from his crying. Do people do it? Now, I've never in my life witnessed... Uh, a situation like this where the preacher simultaneously blasphemes God and degrades God while promising to rescue God if you just give him your money. And again, I've heard others say this, how this man has not been struck down on the spot only testifies to the immeasurable mercy of God Almighty. Now, I want you to also note that in the beginning of this clip where he says, well, I wasn't going to do this. I, I, I wasn't going to ask for an offering, but, you know, God, he, uh, he's the one that wants me to do this. Uh, watch as I go forward a little bit. He's got all the ways to give ready to go on a slide. He, he says he wasn't going to do this, but uh, here's a readied slide of all the ways you can give to me. There's my website, there's PayPal, you can text to give, there's the mobile app, and I'm sure he's got an address where you can send in a check if you're not digital. So again, just, uh, you know, discern when you see this stuff. And I think that's the sad thing. There's so many people that aren't discerning. You get somebody like this who just comes forward and tells a story, and well, they don't bother to check, they just believe it. In Romans chapter 16, we can scroll down. Let's read uh, verse 17 and 18. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. By good words and fair speeches. How about fantasy speeches? How about lying tales of taking trips to heaven, which sound really good, and they deceive the hearts of the simple, the simple being the gullible. They just believe it. 
But also in verse 17, uh, because you didn't hear the true gospel preached, there was no anguish. There was no death, burial, or resurrection of Jesus Christ. The worship was not placed on Jesus Christ. Uh, it was placed on Jesse Duplantis. He's the remarkable one in this whole story. This is definitely, this could go into the category of being contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. That doctrine being what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did for us when he died an agonizing death at the cross. And he did it to save us. He shed his blood to save sinners from hell. But Jesse focused on material things and monetary gain and how remarkable he was. This narcissistic, absolute monster. It's monstrous what he did in this video clip. Now, in summary, as I close this video, from the clips, just the clips that I played you, here's what we learned. That Jesus personally built Jesse's mansion. Jesus also personally built a table for Jesse. Jesse testified of being taken the way of viewing mountains in heaven because, well, that's what Jesse's likes were. It's his desire. Jesse encountered talking horses and flying babies while being served by King David, the Apostle Paul, and Abraham. I didn't play the clip from Abraham, but uh, it's in there. Now, Jesse was admired by Jesus. In fact, Jesus crept into Jesse's room just to watch him sleep because Jesse's so precious. Jesse was informed that he would preach to half the world population, 2.9 billion people. Once you factor out 25% of 8 billion, because under uh, the age of 14, leaves you with 6 billion. Jesse was told that the devil was afraid of him. <laughs> and trust me, the devil's not afraid of Jesse. The devil loves Jesse. The devil wishes he had a million more like Jesse. And, and that's actually coming closer to happening with all the heresy that's out there. Uh, we learned that Jesse glowed like Moses. And why not? We learned that it was Jesse uh, who told us that Jesus... Uh, is crying and uh, you need to give me your money so we can help the Messiah. He needs saving. And only Jesse can do it by you giving him your money. And then we also learned that it was Jesse. Uh, we learned, uh, as Jesse told us, that God the Father chuckled and said, basically, Jesus couldn't keep secrets. So God the Father is not revealing the timing of the rapture to Jesus because apparently Jesus is untrustworthy. Is this just all astonishing? And again, nothing of the gospel preached. A fantasy story. This was what's called a money grab. And I bet he grabbed a lot of money. Fantasy stories. You know, folks, certainly pray for Jesse Duplantis. This man is reprobate. Uh, but certainly pray for him. Uh, it, but if you're a listener and you find yourself uh, in a church listening to fantasy tales about trips to heaven, uh, I would suggest you get up and walk out. And then I would suggest you open your Bible and read and study your uh, to show yourself approved. Seek Jesus Christ uh, through his holy word. Fellowship with Jesus. Preach the true gospel. And serve Jesus Christ in truth and sincerity and in sober-mindedness.